it. Are okay. you going to use a, um, the podium? This is uh, a music stand, not a real I podium. Know. I do We'll see. Um, are you going to have the PowerPoint on I there? can. Why don't we go ahead and put it on there, and then we have it available if we want it. Okay. And I've got my All right. We've got about four minutes. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to go till about 1.45. Okay. I mean, you can go earlier if you want, but if you can definitely wrap it up Half at 1.45. Um, I'm going to try to finish my part in about 15, maybe 20 minutes. Okay. Then leave 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Is that clock correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. is a little faster. That's... <laughs> Okay, so this moves it forward. All right. This moves it back, forward, back. Yeah. Push this, and the screen goes black. Well, I don't think I need to do that. But um, okay. And this is the pointer. Oh, I don't think I necessarily need that either. No, because it doesn't show up on the screen. And I'm getting entangled here. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So. I'm gonna turn this on. I'm going to sit while you're doing yours. I'll just sit over here and listen. And then okay, you know, we can that's fine. Places. Let me get rid of. Let me get rid of the phone. Hello. You're gonna sit? I won't. Um, just while you're talking. Oh no, no I mean, on the stool. No, I'm gonna stand okay. on the stool. I'm not either. Can't do that. Yeah, except it feels in, awkward. Except in media crit. Okay. That's the only class I do that. Okay. Because I can't. How's Cap? Researching and starting to get some answers for a handoff team of neurotologists. Oh, good. We've got some good uh, potential people that are really specializing in what she has. So. Good. So we're hopeful about that. Hopefully close to where you live and not, because the state is huge. No, in fact, um, both San Antonio, which is like 40 minutes away. Yeah, it's not too bad. Austin's like 20 minutes away. Okay. And each of them have a huge kind of hearing balance center. Good. Oh, praise God. So, uh, when do you guys move? Uh, early December. Okay. Okay. Not okay. I wish you weren't, but I understand it. <laughs> We just got an update on our home. All the cabinets just went in. Um, all of that, that stuff is going on. Good. So, and then this coming week, all the, 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 the pipe fixtures and all that go in. And then the flooring and the appliances, and then we're done. So it's and air conditioning, right? No, that's all been done. Oh, okay. Because you don't want to buy a house anywhere near that part of Texas it's without air conditioning. That's the smart thing. Duck work. Good. That makes sense. Yeah, because it it's like it's like ha li go outside and it's like you're in a shower. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's brutal. Brutal. Oh, Kurt. What's that? Not quite so bad central Texas. No. Yeah. No. But boy, Austin and San Antonio. Wow. And rain? I've never seen rain heavier than commuting from Austin to San Antonio. And that's why there's a huge underground aquifer that feeds all the central Texas. Oh, I can believe that. All that rain, yeah. Okay. So let's. Chairs. Don't they feel 
I'm not going to close it all the way, but just a little bit. Come on in. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. Oh, you guys are ready. You got your book of common prayer. Okay. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Well, I'm welcome, everyone. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, holy orders and uh, <clears throat> the vestry, so Anglican ecclesiology. And uh, since I know we're, I can't be late to the service because I'm celebrating, we got to make sure that everything works. So let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Oh, gracious and eternal Father, we are so thankful that we can come together as members of your body, to worship together, to fellowship together, to break bread together, and to pray together. Pray for your blessing upon this class and for the service following. May our hearts be open and our ears wide open to hear your Holy Spirit and to be ministered and worship you. We ask all of this in the name of your loving Son. Amen. So... <clears throat> You're probably shocked, but I got the first one, which is on holy orders, you know, and I had the uniform to go with it. So <clears throat> when we talk about Anglican ecclesiology, we talk about, we actually pull some of this from the Book of Common Prayer. The ordinal is in the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordinal, the first Book of Common Prayer was 1549. The ordinal was basically how you ordain a deacon a priest and a bishop was originally constructed in 1550. In 1552, it went into the Book of Common Prayer. So you can actually see and remind, the clergy can be reminded of the vows they took and the commitments that they made. And these are made publicly uh, as part of the ordination service. So here is from our Book of Common Prayer, uh, the preface, it's almost word for word from the 1550 preference. It's been updated, and trust me, the spelling has been improved. Uh, the preface of the ordinal is found in it states, Holy Scriptures and ancient authors teach that from the apostles' time, there are three orders of ministries that existed in Christ's church. Bishops, priests, and deacons, from the earliest days of the church, these offices were always held in such revel uh, reverent estimation that no one might presume to execute any of them without being first called, tried, examined, and ascertained. So you will actually see that in the ordinal because we are exhorted. Deacons have an exhortation. Priests have an exhortation. Bishops have an exhortation. We are examined. And then we must all, deacons, priests, and bishops, sign both the oath of conformity and the oath of canonical obedience, which basically means we'll give obedience to our bishop in things that are justified and right. Bishop goes off the rail, we don't have to follow the bishop. And the oath of conformity says, we do believe that the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God and to contain all things necessary for salvation. And I consequently hold myself bound to conform my life and ministry thereunto, and therefore I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ's church as this church has, been, has received them. We must, we make that publicly in our ordination, both as a deacon and then as a priest, and then a consecration of a bishop, and then we sign them publicly. Okay, so everybody knows we made this commitment. So ordination for Anglicans have come to understand an act of the whole church. Uh, the bishop is representing, is presiding acts on behalf of the community. The, unlike some churches, our ordination service is in the Book of Common Prayer. Everybody can see it. There's nothing done behind closed doors. There's no sleight of hand. And the congregation, the community, has input, just like you have. And you can thank Thomas Cramer for putting this in the wedding vows. If anyone has an objection, speak now. 
The same thing is in all the ordination vows. Anybody has, knows anything about a crime or anything? Speak. And so these are the laity and the clergy together at all processes of holy orders. It's not, oh, I know you. Yes, you can be ordained. Let me lay hands on you. No, not like that at all. So most of the founders of the Anglican Church believe strongly in the priesthood of all believers. Uh, but they advocated for the continuance of deacons, priests, and bishops. So that's why we kept it. You know, the view of the Anglican Church, as I said when I talked about the history, they didn't assume that everything before the Reformation was wrong. If they could find a biblical principle, they kept it. If they couldn't, they threw it out, or they made it just tradition. So that's why the Anglican Church has these three offices. Ordinal is placed within it so we can see, as I said, the vows. We can go back at any time and look at the vows uh, that we made publicly and our examination, the questions that we answered, all public. It's all in the Book of Common Prayer. So England clergy, especially priests, are called for public ministry as messengers, watchmen, stewards, and shepherds, all based on scriptural readings. And there are different scriptural readings both for the deacons and for the priests and for the bishops. Again, reminding, all back to scripture. And then the Holy Spirit is invoked by the bishop to pray over the ordinands, to, to uh, uh, consecrate them, and make them either deacons or priests. It takes one bishop to ordain deacons and priests, takes three bishops to consecrate another bishop. Yeah, oh, priests cannot do that to bishops. Only bishops can do bishops, okay? There are two types of deacons. We'll get into this in a little bit. There are transitional, who are serving in this ministry for a year or so. Uh, they usually have a background in ministry. They usually have the educational requirement, and it's basically an internship for about a year, unless they have lots of ministry experience, and then the bishop can speed up the process but they serve at least a year. They can serve longer if they're transitional, but at least a year unless they have lots of ministerial experience. And then we have the transitional. Uh, they are the ones that can become priests. And then the vocational deacons stay a deacon throughout their public ministry. And as our bishop likes to say, once a deacon, always a deacon because you become a deacon, and then you become a priest, and then you become a bishop. So you all have that deacon, the diaconate, the idea is you're serving. That's the purpose of a deacon, to serve. And it's that constant reminder, you are here to serve the church both inside the congregation and outside. So let me give you sort of the step-by-step -step process of how holy orders works in C4SO, in our diocese, okay? So, starts local process. You are the aspirant. You feel called to the ministry. So the first thing you do is you have to talk to a priest or a rector to help with the discernment process. Right? Then you have to write your spiritual autobiography. Then you have to engage a spiritual director so that you're constantly getting mentored. Uh, then we do an initial educational assessment. Do you have a certificate from Anglican Studies? If you don't have that, uh, do you have an MDiv? MDiv is sort of the minimal that you need uh, in ACNA. Okay? If I don't have an MDiv, but I have a PhD and I had years of service, in ministry and was licensed by another organization. So I got a waiver. They go, you already have a PhD. You don't need to go back and get the MDiv. But MDiv is expected. So we expect a certain level of education and training of all clergy. You then have to have a spousal support le letter. If you're <laughs> married, we want to know what your spouse thinks. I went through that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. We want to know because if your spouse says, under no condition order, ordain that person, okay, it's not going to happen. Okay. Or if they say, well, they can be ordained, but I don't want anything to do with that. We want to know. Okay. We want to know because both are involved in some form of ministry. And if it could be simply support. Okay. And then do you have a recommendation after the process? Do you have a recommendation from the rector? Then what the rector does is the rector forms a parish discernment committee. And this is one of the most important aspects of the ordination process. This is made up of laity, primarily laity, from the congregation, the people that know you, the people that have ministered with you, who have seen your ministry. There might be one or two clergy, but usually it's almost all laity. And they meet five to six times to interview you about what's your view of scripture? What do you think about ministry? They even interview your spouse for one time. And no, it's not a tag team. You don't get a rebuttal. OK, so, <laughs> so this, this can take three to six months uh, because they don't meet you know, all at once. These are usually an hour, and they're usually six to seven meetings. Then the parish discernment committee writes a, re a letter of recommendation. Now, if the, the parish discernment committee can say yes, no, or we still have some concerns. But the parish gets feedback. <clears throat> if everything goes well here, you become a postulate. One more step. It's called the deanery process. You meet with the dean, and the dean is the senior clergy member in the regional part. So our dean uh, it has a church up in Santa Monica, the vintage, Gare Jones. And so you would have to meet with Gare. It could be over Zoom or it could be personally, and he'd want to talk to you he would have a copy of the Parish Discernment Committee report. Okay. So you meet with him, and then he is supposed to give a recommendation. If all the paperwork is done, you know, you've done your application for holy orders, you have your Parish Discernment Committee, you have your spousal support letter, you have your educational aspect, basically your, your resume, uh, and interview with the dean in their report, then you go to the ordination preparation team or the commission on ministry. <clears throat> and I chair the one for the Western United States, although we often take interviews across the country, don't we, Susan, in Israel? <laughs> so you go to the parish discernment committee, and this is made up of laity and clergy, more clergy, than there would be on the Parish Discernment Committee, and we interview you. We have all the paperwork. And based on that paperwork, we're going to ask you some questions. What about this, and what about this, and what about this? And then we write up a report. And we, don't, we can't sink an application, OK? Everything's up to the bishop. But we write up a report, and then we send it all to the canon for ordinations. So can you see the stack of paperwork and all these reports? <clears throat> then, if everything goes positive, you become a candidate. All right? And one of the things they do in assessment and training is a background check. And the background check we use, we originally used to do just a basic background check. No, it's an FBI background check. OK, you sign up, and it's an FBI background check. Because that will let us know if there's anything that you've done you know, during your time in the United States, FBI is going to know about it. OK, and again, that report is sent over to the bishop's office. We do psychological assessment, and they get to choose what they want to do. They do marital assessment. If there are little concerns that might have come across, or they're a little concerned, like, you know, the spouse wasn't as excited as they might have been, they'll send you to a marriage counselor, or you can go to your rector, and they want to report. And that can be multiple weeks, or it can be a one-time thing. But a report is then generated. OK? 
Okay? And then we have the ministry safe training, and all clergy in C4SO have to do that. And that is ministry safe is, you know, all the rules and regulations that are taking care of children to make sure that they're protected. And young adults and adults. And we have to do this. We just finished one for children uh, in September. We've got another one coming up in January. And then I think there's one in the spring. So every two years, just like in the academy, we have to go through these sexual harassment training processes. Again, it's all about protecting the congregation. Then we do preparation for taking ordination exams. Yes, we have exams. <clears throat> and the exams cover the Bible. They cover theology. And what's the other one? Is that church polity? Church history. What's that? Church history. Church history. OK. They've changed it since I've gone through it. <laughs> so you have these exams, and you have to do well. They're given. When you take the exams, they're actually graded, if you will, or evaluated by our canon theologians. Okay. And we have, a, we have a number of canon theologians. And they evaluate them, and they give a report to the bishop's office. Okay. Again, we want, to, we, we want to make sure that clergy are trained, they're prepared, and they're ready to serve. And then they you take a church planning assessment. Why? Because we're a church planning organization. That's what C4SO is. So we want to see if you have the skill sets or if you have the passion to be a church planner. Do you have to be a church planner? No, you don't. Okay. But we want to assess that. Then you have, and this is new, didn't have this way back when, when I did it, candidates retreat and cohort. There's a retreat. There's an online meeting uh, with the bishop and diocesan leaders. And then the bishop, if everything goes well, everything is checked off, the bishop approves you for ordination. Okay. Then you're an ordinan, okay, ready for ordination. And the canon for ordinations, and that is Trish Nelson, canon Trish Nelson out of Overland Park in Kansas. Great church. She's been doing this for a long time. She is phenomenal to work with. And she begins to schedule because you need the bishop there. So she needs to plan when the bishop is going to be there. When will the bishop be in the region? When will the bishop be able to come to do the ordination? Or can the candidate travel to be ordained? Sometimes that happens. Right. Once that's all done, Ordination can take place. Okay? But the final decision is the bishops. Right? It's not any of the committees. We just write reports. It is the bishops' call. Okay? Any questions so far? Yeah? How often does the bishop say no? I know that the committee has said no on a couple of them a parish committee, a parish discernment committee, or ordination preparation just makes a recommendation don't. Uh, and sometimes those are followed. If I miss it, I'm sorry. Generally speaking, how long does this process take? It can take, uh, to be a priest, it could take two to three years. Okay. That's not counting education. Not, not in counting education. Right, if they're doing their MDF or whatever. Yeah, that you want, they'll, right. they'll just slow the process down until you're close to your MDF. You can be ordained a deacon without the MDF. Yeah but they don't want you to be a priest without it, unless you have other education. Yes? Great. Um, is the, how would you say, are we, is there a surplus of, of priests, or is there a deficit? There's a deficit in so, C4, so. Well, no, yeah. Yeah, there's a deficit in, in C4, so. Uh, because we're a church planning organization. You know, we're fortunate here. Uh, th that we have a deacon and three priests. The deacon is employed by the church, but the priests are volunteers. Okay. We receive no, no pay or anything. We do that because this is our parish. That, that is rare. Okay, that's not the way it is it's usually um, in churches. Yes, sir. 
I'm a priest. I'm not a rector. A rector is in charge of a parish. So they're assigned. They're, well, they're chosen by the vestry. Right. And we'll get that. And they're approved by the bishop. He, oh, yeah. He goes back and forth. He's a priest. I'm a priest. I'm not a rector. Uh, my ministry is here, but also my main ministry is over at Vanguard University, where I, I do weekly services over there. So it's, it's a little bit apples and oranges, right? Yeah. A priest is, is, uh, is a credential. It's a credential, and yeah. And rector is an office. That office. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Great way to put it. They allow it. It's the choice of the bishop of the diocese. And C4SO ordains women as priests and bishop, or uh, deacons and priests. But ACNA... It's up to the bishops. Some do, some don't. C4SO does. They have, well, Would they allow women to, if they're already, you know. Some will. Some will say, I will not ordain, but I'll accept. Some will say, no. Many of our Anglo Catholic uh, bishops will not. We do. And we have done it from day one. I mean, you saw Tisha here preach it. We have Vivian. You know, yeah. Yeah, Kep. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have vocational deacons. Again, they remain deacons for the rest of their lives. We have transition ones that ultimately want to be priests. The priest and deacon represent Christ's liturgy. So the priest, certain things that a priest can do, priests can consecrate. They can announce the absolution. And they can bless. Deacon can't do any of those. Okay. Deacon's job is to basically go out into the community and minister as a representative of the church and to tell the priest or the rector, this is what's going on in the church. We need to do X, Y, and Z. They assist with the gospel. Usually, uh, the deacon in many Anglican churches, they're the ones that read the gospel. We don't follow that rule, but that's the traditional rule. Okay. So we have two different types. So transitional deacons equal priests. Again, priest is called to work as a pastor, priest, or teacher, to serve communion, to baptize. Can a deacon baptize? Yes, with permission of the priest or the bishop. Can a deacon do Eucharist? Only if the elements are pre-consecrated. And that's called a deacon mass. And some of the prayers are a little different. Okay. But they can if a priest has already consecrated the elements. And when Todd was the only bishop or the only priest in HTC, that's exactly what we did a lot because he was traveling so much. We'd say, here, consecrate all this, and we'll get his deacon to, to come in and do this. So responsibilities of the bishop, as I've told you, it takes three bishops to consecrate a new bishop. Right? And <clears throat> it's the duty of the bishop to provide discipline to the church by making sure the word of God is preached, the sacraments are administered correctly, and the flock of God is appropriately nurtured. In the Reformation, many of the continental churches put the discipline in the congregation. Anglicans didn't do it. Discipline is with the bishop. So, if the bishop gets a phone call that someone's preaching something that's not in Scripture, it's the bishop's job to discipline. Okay. And they will, trust me, they will. Okay. Not the job of an individual priest. So, responsibilities of a bishop, administer a diocese. You have two different dioceses. You have a geographic diocese, that's a traditional diocese. And you have an affinity diocese. C4SO is an affinity diocese. We have churches from Raleigh, North Carolina to Hawaii. 
okay? We have about 51 congregations that our bishop oversees. We're church planters. So every time you turn around, there's another church being planted. It's what we do or what he does. Bishops are responsible for all ordinations to the diaconate and the priesthood. They oversee the ordination process. They make sure it follows all the rules and the canons. They conduct, traditionally, they conduct a pastoral visit to every parish. Uh, we don't necessarily follow that only because of COVID. So it hasn't worked out. You know, nobody was traveling for, for a year or so. Uh, but our bishop will show up. I don't know when, but he will show up to visit us. They oversee and preside over the diocesan convention, which is coming up next week, or no, the 12th of November, and that's going to be a, online. It, does, it doesn't usually online, but because we're so spread out, our diocesan convention is online. And one of the most important things is that they are a member of the House of Bishops, the policy-making body for the Anglican Church in North America. Hand it off. Hand it off. Okay. Look at that. I have four minutes left. I'm impressed. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just as a lead in to talking about our church and the role of the rector in the vestry, um, this kind of little pyramid kind of helps me in understanding. We have in ACNA, we have our archbishop, who is fully beach. We have the house of bishops. So all the bishops are in the house of bishop, and our bishop is one of those. And each bishop oversees a diocese. Um, we have 28 of those, and C4SO is ours. And then within each diocese, we have individual churches. And the churches are each led by the rector and the vestry. So which way am I going here? Push the a right? button, yep. There we go. <laughs> OK. So the rector and the vestry is what Israel asked me to talk about. And, um, we are governed by some rules and canons, as well as by people. So uh, the canons of ACNA, uh, you can look those up online if you're ever interested. Uh, the canons of our diocese fills in some details that ACNA leaves um, to individual dioceses to decide. Something like Greg's question, do we ordain women? So our canons address that. Um, and then Holy Trinity has bylaws that fill in more details that our diocese leaves to us to determine. So um, I've been on the vestry for uh, a year and seven months. <laughs> Most of what I know comes from this book, which the vestry has been using as kind of our handbook. If you ever agree to serve, we'll be handing you this. Uh, so I'm going to be quoting from this book. It's uh, the, the rector in the vestry, and C4 the author is a retired um, ACNA priest who started in the Episcopal Church and then came to ACNA when ACNA was formed. He's and C4SO. Is he still? Yes. Okay, because Plano is not, right? No, but he's okay. not part of Plano. He was. He was. Okay, very good. So he's still a member of our diocese. Um, and his, his website is there, LeaderWorks, as, as a retired um, priest, or I mean, he's retired as a rector, but he's still a priest. Mm -hmm. And he is uh, leading this group that gives support and uh, advice to um, people in ministry in the Anglican Church. So the rector and the vestry. We talked about this a little bit already. Um, Joanna asked a good question. The rector is another name for the senior pastor of a congregation, OK? So when you hear rector, in other denominations, you would hear, think senior pastor. Um, every church in ACNA, um, every congregation is supposed to be led by a rector who is a priest. And uh, the rector is chosen by the vestry, but approved by the bishop. The vestry doesn't just get to decide to hire someone. The bishop always has to give that approval. And ultimately, um, once the rector is in place, the rector's not working for the vestry or working for the church. The, and the rector is not a member of the church, technically. Any priest who serves here is actually not a member of our church. They are resident in our diocese, and they answer to the bishop as opposed to 
answering to members of the vestry, for example. And there may be other denominations where that's a little different, where the vestry or the board is really more in charge. Our bishop is the person who the rector and all the priests will always answer to. Presbyterian is that way also? Okay, yeah. And it, different churches handle that differently. And, and that's sort of uh, important to know, I, I think, um, as a, a vestry member coming in, um, to really understand that, that we're not giving orders to the rector. The rector answers to our bishop. Um, all the assistant clergy and lay employees are serving at the direction and the pleasure of the rector. So the rector makes all hiring determinations. Um, the vestry does not hire people or fire people. That's done by the rector. Um, and the rector could not be hired or fired without the approval of the bishop. If a congregation or a vestry felt that it was time for a rector to go, they don't get to make that decision. Their job would be to contact the bishop and say, we need to have a talk. <laughs> and then the bishop would be the one who would decide whether that was an appropriate move for the group to take. So the role of the vestry, it, or the, the rector, this really comes out of this book. I'm borrowing from um, Reverend Rosebury. And the role of the rector, beyond sort of the general idea that the rector is the one in charge of the church, um, Rosebury kind of laid out five general uh, areas where he sees this happening in an Anglican church. And these aren't really rules. These are just kind of summarizing the kinds of things you would expect to see the rector doing. He's leading the vision. And he, Rosemary put that number one, the vision statement, for example, for Holy Trinity Church, to be conformed to the image of Christ and community for the sake of others and the glory of God. So how do you work that out? What does it look like? The rector needs to be always be speaking to that and encouraging everyone in the congregation to be moving towards that direction. Um, if you go on our website, you'll see that it's um, fleshed out a little bit with additional um, language where Jordan worked with the vestry when he came in to uh, put more meat on that, those bones. So he talks about uh, what that would look like in terms of our worship, in terms of our formation, and in terms of mission and seeing those as the three key areas where we're trying to live out this vision. Uh, the rector builds the team. I mentioned he's the one that hires and fires. He's also looking at building a team of lay people in the church, whether they're volunteers or, or uh, employed, to be living out this vision and making it happen. He's providing for the people. He's a shepherd. He's making sure that the needs of the congregation spiritual or otherwise, are, are being attended to. He is maintaining accountability. The rector doesn't just stand as a lone ranger, is the wording that Rosebury used. He is accountable to the bishop. He's accountable to the other priests in his diocese or her diocese. In our diocese, it would be him or her, mm -hmm. um, or deacons. Um, the clergy in our diocese meet periodically at the deanery and they hold each other accountable. And the other thing the rector needs to be doing, according to Rosebury, and, and our church has worked out in a very specific way, is to be accountable, obviously, to God and to have uh, a healthy spiritual life. And so one of the things the vestry has always done here is approve funding for our rector to have a spiritual director that the rector would meet with and have that accountability as well. And developing stewardship that includes financial, it includes any kind of stewardship of all the resources of the church, of the time and talents of the people in the church, to steward those so that you can move always in the direction of that vision. So the vestry exists to support the rector. That's our purpose. And every church is supposed to have a vestry. This is in the canons of ACNA and also our diocese and our church. Um, the rector is a member of the vestry, and in normal times, when we have a rector. The rector is the leader of the vestry. And the vestry at Holy Trinity, we've set the number of six members, um, each serving a term of three years, and they rotate on and off. So every year, 
two vestry members will rotate off and two new ones will come on. And the way those folks are chosen, um, the vestry appoints a nominating committee every year to develop a list of names. And then the vestry will select from two of those names. Um, the rector normally has quite a bit of uh, say in that. Uh, Jordan was really the one who was interviewing people and, and making those determinations. Um, and then the vestry selects them. They are presented <coughs> at the annual general, general meeting. And you may remember we had one this last year. We did it on Zoom, if yep. I remember correctly. Um, and we set them forward and said, we're asking you for, for you to ratify these two people to be on the vestry. So that's how the vestry is chosen. Uh, we have two wardens, and this is standard. You'll see this in, um, I think, every Anglican church. There's a senior warden and a junior warden. And what does that mean? Um, the senior warden, and I'm your senior, war senior warden at this time, is appointed by the rector. And according to our bylaws, the rector can choose the senior warden either from the existing vestry or the rector could choose someone completely different and ask them to come and serve. And the senior warden is normal times, just another member of the vestry, although the rector in, their, in choosing someone to be a senior warden, they're looking for someone that if they need to call someone, something's come up, they need advice right away. The senior warden's kind of the point person that the rector would contact. Mm -hmm. um, but when there is no rector, <laughs> the senior warden, becomes the leader of the church, the head of the vestry. And um, they stay that way until there's a new rector. So as you can imagine, when the senior warden hears the rector's leaving, their first concern, <laughs> <laughs> their very first concern is, we need an interim pastor. We need one now. <laughs> because the, the warden's not clergy, right? None of the vestry are clergy. So uh, for our church, that was my first concern. And our bishop appoints our interim pastors. And as you know, Bishop Todd appointed for us too. Uh, they're sharing those responsibilities because they both have other commitments as well. So uh, we have Pastor Todd Pickett. Thank you very much as our preaching pastor. And he is not only preaching, but he's the one that is organizing any guest preachers on the Sundays that he's not preaching. And we have Mike McNichols who is coming into the office, overseeing the work, uh, administrative work that Vivian is doing, working with Israel on the formation uh, aspects, and uh, providing pastoral care as needed. So that's a load off my <laughs> mind. <laughs> as senior warden, um, I am leading the vestry meetings now. Um, our rector normally did that before. Uh, so. Uh, I'll be really glad when we have a new rector. Uh, <laughs> we, we also have a junior warden, and the, the junior warden is uh, traditionally known as the people's warden. Um, the junior warden is elected by the vestry from the vestry, and uh, traditionally the people's warden is called that because that person is supposed to be available to the congregation for the congregation to come and make mm -hmm. any requests or bring any issues to the junior warden, the junior warden would take those to the vestry. We're a small enough church that we don't stand on those formalities. You can all come and talk to any of us. But we, our junior warden is Hunter Taylor, and he is particularly available. If you have concerns as a member of congregation, you should feel free to go and talk to him. Um, the role of the vestry, this again comes from Rosebury's book is to protect the vision. So the, we talked about our vision statement, always being staying, staying focused on making sure that whatever we're doing as a church, we're moving in that direction of following that vision. Um, supporting the methods and means, that just means kind of the nuts and bolts. How do we see this happen? How do we make sure that we have a building to meet in? How do we make sure that we have um, everything we need in the service on Sundays, all those kind of um, details, we, we don't go in and, and set up. You see Vivian doing that. She's really organizing that. But if there is a need that she has, she brings it to us. Our 
normally she'd bring it to the director, he'd bring it to us and say, okay, we need to make some decisions on how to make this happen. We're upholding the financial integrity of the church. That's a big part of what we're doing at the end of the year here, looking at the budget, planning the budget next year. We're supporting the rector as spiritual leader. Again, the vestry is not directing the rector. The vestry is there to support the rector in their ministry and to support all the clergy in their ministry at the church. And model a strong commitment to generosity. Um, you do hear us talking about the budget. We make announcements periodically. The vestry is supposed to be paying attention to how are we financially supporting the church. And if there's a need, we're going to bring it to you. We need to be committed to the idea that God loves cheerful givers and <laughs> that this is an important part of being a part of the church. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, the search committee. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, how it's done according to the bylaws at Holy Trinity. Um, as soon as we knew that we needed a new rector, the vestry is charged with forming a search committee. The search committee can either be anyone we choose or it can be just the vestry. And we are following the pattern that was set three and a half now, almost four years ago when Bishop Todd left us to have the search committee just be the vestry. We were already together, already had regular meetings scheduled. We decided that was probably the best way to do this. Um, maybe just a little bit about where we're at in that. I mean, you've been hearing announcements from us on a regular basis on this, but we've been collecting names, collecting uh, spiritual biographies and resumes from people. We're now at the stage where we're going to be scheduling interviews very soon, so we're excited to see that happen. Uh, when we have someone selected that we would like to call, we will first contact our bishop, and our bishop must approve the person. When we have the approval of the bishop, then we can make the offer to our candidate, and if they accept, then the senior warden notifies the secretary of our diocese. That's just the official process to say that the rector has accepted our offer and then the person is hired. So that's a general overview of the search process. Um, I'm leaving some time here so that if you have questions, you can ask them. And I think that's our last slide. Um, but I've kind of tried to just cover those things pretty quickly. Um, do you have questions about how the vestry is functioning? here at Holy Trinity or generally in, in the Anglican Church about our search process. Anything else you would like to know? Joanna. Uh, you mentioned or someone mentioned membership. Yes. <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There is, a, there is a one. <laughs> it's, it's been a, an <laughs> issue here. In, in most Anglican churches, I mean, traditionally, I came out of the Episcopal Church. Traditionally, you became a member when you were baptized. You became a voting member when you were 16 years of age and you had been confirmed. We're not that formal in C4SO. Um, our, our by rules say that, uh, a bylaw say that you are a member if you're 16 years old and you are a baptized uh, Christian. Um, as far as voting goes, uh, I think that's an area we need to tighten up because it's, it's something that we've been talking about for a while and it has not really been generated. We don't have a membership list other than what you see on Breeze or, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there are people on Breeze yeah. who no that's longer, all we got. There, yeah, there are no, people on Breeze who no longer live in the area or people on Breeze who joined us online via Zoom, especially during COVID, and they watch. And some of those people give to our no. congregation. Um, are they members? Uh, I'm not really sure because our bylaws are not that detailed. And I think that's something that a future vestry should probably deal with. Right now, I think the the main thing is we need a rector, yes. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's on the list of, of yeah. really tightening that up, of saying, well, are we going to have a process where someone becomes a member? We, we have not had that historically. We do, we do. Yeah. Our, our, if the church got sued or something, 
far as the law is concerned, the investors and people that mm -hmm. have to answer for what's going on. That is true. Yeah, the bylaws kind of define all of us as members of uh, officers of the corporation. So uh, my signature is on all the bank statements when I became senior warden. Um, and Sally Ray, our secretary of our vestry, her signature is also on all those documents. Yeah, so, so we're highly motivated to keep an eye on the financial status. <laughs> we're, we're also, I mean, I really started paying attention in September when they uh, started sending out email announcements to the, um, just to the diocese and said, you know, this is Child Protection Month. Mm -hmm. And I started really, actually I listened to a C4SO podcast where an attorney for the diocese was talking about those issues. Mm -hmm. And I sort of realized, you know, the vestry has a pretty um, high level of responsibility there. I started quizzing Israel. What are we doing in, <laughs> in Sunday school? You know, those kind of things. What are our policies? Oh, because we're responsible for that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Greg. Maybe the first one. Um, interesting that the priest is accountable to the bishop. Mm -hmm. What accountability does, does the rector here have to the vestry? And I ask that in that you would think that the vestry, that it, it, almost like a Republican democracy, you represent us, the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a little clarification of that. Sure. Regard. And I had one for Tom. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and that's why the vestry are lay people, that we're members of the congregation, and we are accountable to the congregation to do what's right for the church, um, obviously. At, should be obvious, but it, it, we are. And so if the vestry has a concern, um, their first responsibility would be to raise it with the rector. Yeah. If the vestry felt that the rector was not being responsive, or if something came up where they felt they couldn't go to the rector first, the vestry can go directly to the bishop mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so I was in a church many years ago where there was some inappropriate behavior by the rector. And Vestry confronted the rector and said, is this true? The rector confessed it. They said, you need to leave. They had to go to their bishop to get mm -hmm. the approval for that. In that case, the, the rector voluntarily resigned. But yes, the vet, the vestry definitely felt like they had a responsibility to confront something that was wrong, and they did. Mm -hmm. So you would expect a vestry to do that. The vestry does not rubber stamp what Ooh. the rector does, but the vestry is not leading the decisions of the ministry of the church. That would be the responsibility of the rector. Yeah. Yes, Craig. You had a comment that priests Bless. Yes. Can deacons bless? No. So that priesthood of all believers, we have children blessing people in our church. That's a different no, blessing. No, 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 I was just going to say. Yeah. That's a different I think blessing. That's a real deal, you know, or, or is that. That's an anointing. A low grade? Yeah, that's low grade. Uh, the blessing we're talking about <laughs> is the blessing at, at the benediction. So generally, it's the priest that gives the benediction, the final blessing. That's what that's so what we, we do. Mm -hmm. Not the children anointing the prayer work. So you clericals have given us sort of a, a, a nice downgraded blessing cost for the prayer. Anointing, unction. Yeah. Yeah. And let me say also that the vestry, because I was senior warden until I got ordained and then I couldn't be on the, the vestry, um, they, they were responsible for watching the books. So the, the uh, rector cannot go out there and spend whatever they want. And it's like, nope. It's, they don't control the money. Uh, <laughs> they make recommendations to the vestry, but it's the vestry that has to approve it. So, so as far as the rules, uh, the, uh, an ordained priest can't sit on the vestry? Cannot. Yes. That's right. Cannot sit. Yeah. So I was, uh, I voluntarily, when I became a deacon, I stepped off. Uh, and they, they said, well, you can come and observe. I was like, nope. nope. <laughs> I'm off. Yeah. So, right, so every year um, the vestry asks the nominated committee to give us a list of people who 
um, or potential vestry members. Um, obviously, we want someone who's been with the church for a while, that we know them and have some history with the person. Um, and then the rector up until now has been the one who said, I'm going to pick from that list. I mean, Susan, I don't know if you can address this, but I, I remember talking about this last year, and last year was my first year doing this. Um, we had the list of potential names. I don't remember if the vestry said to Jordan, oh, we think these two are the best, or if Jordan said, I'm going to talk to these people. I mean, the first question is, who's, who's willing to do it? Sometimes yeah. you, you think, oh, this person would be good, and then you mm -hmm. find out they have other commitments and they can't. So I don't really remember how that think, dynamic worked. I think that basically the rector needs to have like a relationship with this person, mm -hmm. and he will then come back to the vestry and say, um, you know, I, th I think I'd like to choose these two people. Mm -hmm. And usually it's confirmed because we've already looked Yeah, so I mean, Jordan really led that effort yeah. last year, yeah. so. And there isn't, I don't think there's a specific like rule about how that's done. It's kind of a joint thing of this person would fill in a, a, good, uh, a good voice in the rest, in the rest, in the vestry. Because uh, we, tr we try to have like people from different backgrounds yeah. and different experience mm -hmm. so that they uh, fill in the needs of the best mm -hmm. And also that we get voices from uh, across the congregation. Yeah. So um, we tend to skew older. We're always kind of looking at can we bring some younger people in so that we're not, and that's kind of a, according to Rosebury, kind of a common thing in a lot of churches that um, you have the vestry skewing older. Are your youth being represented? Mm -hmm. um, are uh, younger families being represented? We're kind of looking for that um, yeah, as well. Yeah. We've always tried to have some younger people too. Yeah. In fact, I think in some vestries, they usually have someone that is a teenager and adolescent. Oh, really? Who serves yeah, they do um, sometimes. As a specific, in a specific role. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. I haven't seen that done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's a rule. No. Yeah. So it's putting two people forward for approval. It's not really like a slate of electors and two get and two don't. Right? We don't do that. Yeah. No. Yeah. There are churches that do that yeah. where there's an election yeah. and there's a slate of like six mm -hmm. people and the congregation votes at the annual meeting and they pick two of those. Mm -hmm. In our church, our bylaws are set up where the vestry picks the two people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greg. Of your vestry. and or or is it just a general you know it, it, you have someone assigned to you first you have somebody how's that work with your best we're not that specialized we feel like we all need to be paying attention to what's happening um, we I mean besides our senior and junior warden who um, you know right now have some specific duties that maybe we wouldn't have with a rector in place um, Sally is our secretary is keeping the minutes. Uh, we have a treasurer, I should mention, Roger Clark. He's not on the vestry. He has the office of treasurer, and he's been the treasurer for I don't know how many time. years. He's, long time. He's given us really tireless service, and I'm very appreciative to have him as someone over the years who has this knowledge of how did we do this last year? How did we do it three years ago? We also have an accounting firm that gives us a report every month. Um, and so the, the vestry is looking at those accounting reports um, from that firm to see where things stand every month. Um, and I have access to see online what our bank statement looks like. Um, so that's sort of important to be able to monitor that. Um, and as we're looking for the budget for next year, um, I'm relying on, on Roger. He and I have been doing the numbers to say, all right, what did the giving look like this year? Our budget is going to be based on what was the giving, what was the income this year? And so 
trying to predict that can be difficult. I mean, for example, last year, 40% of the income of the church came in during the last quarter, October, November, December. So right now, I don't have October numbers for this year, but that presents a little challenge mm -hmm. in trying to figure out what is next year's budget going to yeah. look like. But we're, we're keeping an eye, a very close eye on that right now because we need the budget ratified before um, January 1st. So. The other thing, we've been really fortunate that we've had an attorney on our vestry yeah. for the last, I don't know, five years probably. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's been really helpful, and their input has been really valuable. So as you can see, like financial, legal, um, then spiritual, and Christian ed, and so forth, are kind of all represented along with good administrative kind of skills and background um, that help with the direction and so forth of the church. Yeah. But I, I think that the, the spiritual nature of this position is the most important thing that uh, the rectors have always felt like that was really important to have in order to really, as, as the, the vision says, uh, you've got to have And the diocese also has a chancellor, which is an attorney specializing in church law, uh, lives locally. So uh, that's who Todd goes to, but we could also contact them if we had a particular question. Uh, he works for the diocese. Yeah. And he has a practicing attorney, so he has his own firm. Too. You had mentioned we're a part of a diocese. Mm -hmm. What other churches are in the diocese with, with us? Trinity? It's affinity. So our our uh, diocese, we have a church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, that's being about the local oh, diocese. that is well, that is our diocese. We have a deanery, oh, a deanery, okay, and that's all churches in Southern California, like Vintage. Uh, we've got uh, the One Tisha Resurrection. We have one in Malibu. We have one in San Marcos. In the Vine is in the Vine up in Fullerton. 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 Yeah, uh, and yeah. we plant churches. So we planted uh, the Vine in Fullerton. Do you Came know how many of... churches are in the deanery? I don't know. No, I don't because it fluctuates. Is that just Southern California? Just Southern California. Yeah. That's pretty crazy to have that many churches in a there's an historical reason for that, actually. We're, we're unusual because yeah. most dioceses in ACNA are geographically um, circumscribed. The reason we're like this is because when Todd Hunter became a bishop, he was asked by uh, ACNA to please come and help ACNA plant new churches. So that's his mission. That's his, um, mm -hmm. his calling. Mm -hmm. And so he will you know, take people into the diocese. They want to plant a new church anywhere in the country. He'll take them in. Um, it, there is a provision once a church is established, if they want to join their local geographical yeah. diocese, they can do that. Mm -hmm. And Todd has been very uh, willing to say, sure, if you would like to transfer to the uh, local bishop, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people really like working with Todd Hunter. So we have people all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Kurt, you had a question? Oh, but other geographic dioceses also still have deaneries, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And de uh, the dean is usually the senior uh, priest in the area. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so they're the dean. Uh, their title is uh, the very reverend. You know, just like a canon, we have our canon theologians, they're very reverent. We don't go by the titles. Okay. No, we don't. I mean, yeah, we don't do that. Well, you know, I tell our bishop, my Lord Bishop, because, you know, they sit in the House of Lords in England. He goes, no, 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 Todd. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, when Kep and I moved to Austin, we will stay in C4SO because there's pre-C4SO churches. In Austin. 20 minutes of us. So, so I will stay in, in this diocese and Todd will be our bishop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have 
I'm looking at the time. I want to give everyone a chance to head out before the service starts. I'll close in prayer very briefly. And thank you for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Father God, we thank you for your provision for our church, for the members here. And we pray for your continued guidance and blessing on our congregation and our mission to serve out the vision that you've called us to. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.